Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1 says that the president, quote, shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. But other than that, there are no limits explicitly set out in the text itself. So it's fairly broad power as, as Article 2 powers go. We tend to have kind of a common law way of interpreting the Constitution case by case. And I can certainly imagine a context in which a court might take cognizance and say of a president, you're abusing that power and we're not going to recognize it. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. This is Bob Ambrogi coming to you from a little bit outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I write a blog called Law Sites, also co-host another Legal Talk Network program called Law Technology Now, along with Monica Bay. And uh, when I'm not doing all that, I'm practicing law. Uh, my co-host, J. Craig Williams, uh, is not able to be with us today. He's, uh, he's away, and uh, we'll be back on our next show. Before we uh, introduce today's topic, let me just take a moment to quickly thank our sponsors, Clio and Latera. Clio's cloud-based practice management software makes it easy to manage your law firm from intake to invoice. Try it for free at clio.com. That's C-L-I-O.com. And Latera is the authority on document creation, collaboration, and control. You can increase your productivity, collaborate securely, and ensure protection of your vital information with Latera. Learn more at latera.com, L-I-T-E-R.com. Amidst the special counsel investigation into uh, the Trump administration's possible collusion with Russia. Uh, word came out, it was reported initially by the Washington Post, that President Trump had asked his staff to look into his pardon power and that uh, some of the attorneys on his staff were investigating his pardon power. So uh, that's raised a lot of questions about exactly what the scope is of the president's pardon power, and in particular, many are asking or wondering whether the president could, in fact, pardon himself should the circumstances call for it. So today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to take a look at the presidential pardon power, look at the uh, history and background of the power, what it encompasses, and what this might mean as applied to the current state of affairs. And to help us do that today, we have two guests who are knowledgeable in this area. First of all, let me welcome to the program Brian C. Colt. Brian is a professor of law and the Harold Norris Faculty Scholar at Michigan State University College of Law. His research focuses on structural constitutional law and juries, uh, and he teaches uh, torts and administrative law. Way back when he was still a law student, he wrote a, a note for the Yale Law Journal titled, Pardon Me, The Constitutional Case Against Presidential Self-Pardons. And more recently, he wrote the book, Constitutional Cliffhangers, A Legal Guide for Presidents and Their Enemies. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer, Brian Colt. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us. And also joining us today is Robert L. Dietz, Professor of Public Policy at the Schar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Uh, Bob was a senior counselor to the director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 2006 to 2009. From 1998 to 2006, he was the general counsel at the National Security Agency, where he represented the NSA in all legal matters. He's also held positions as acting general counsel at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and as acting deputy general counsel intelligence at the Department of Defense. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer, Bob Dietz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Brian, I have to vary a little bit. I'm just, I'm curious, uh, back in 1996, when you decided to write that note on whether the uh, president could pardon him or herself, Bill Clinton was president at the time. What, what prompted you to write that back in 1996? 
Well, in 1996, the whole Whitewater investigation was still pretty hypothetical. I was just in a criminal procedure class, and we were talking about presidential pardons, not something that you spend a lot of time talking about in Crim Pro, but I asked the professor, uh, I said, can the president pardon himself? And he said, I don't know, you should look into that. So I did. And I got my my note out of that and uh, convinced myself that the best argument was that he couldn't pardon himself. But it was an open question then. It's an open question now. It's been talked about at the end of Clinton's term. Uh, people talked about it at the end of Bush's. And now they're talking about it again. So I'm glad I thought about it when it was hypothetical and not in the light of a particular case, because then I could figure out what I thought without regard to whether I liked the president or not. I want to discuss uh, in more detail the the president's ability to pardon himself. But before we do that, I want to step back and look at the pardon power itself. And, and Brian, I wanted to ask you if you could uh, set the stage for us by telling us what the Constitution says about pardons. Sure. Well, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1 says that the president, quote, shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. So by limiting it to offenses against the United States, that's applying only to federal criminal uh, proceedings. And except in cases of impeachment, that separates out impeachment as a congressional a political process that is not about criminal law and is beyond the reach of the pardon power. But other than that, there are no limits explicitly set out in the text itself. So it's a, it's a fairly broad power as, as Article II powers go. And why, Bob Dietz, do you know, what were the framers thinking? Why did they include this power in the Constitution? This was a traditional power of the crown, and I think they just brought it in uh, because of the, of the prior experience. And, you know, I agree with everything that Brian has said so far. It is incredibly terse language, uh, unqualified. Yeah, as you know, we tend to have kind of a common law way of interpreting the Constitution case by case. And I can certainly imagine a context in which a court might take cognizance and say of a president, you're abusing that power and we're not going to recognize it. Now, whether that would apply to pardoning himself, I don't know the answer to that, but that's a, that's a different issue. As you may know, in, in Virginia, I think it was this past year, or perhaps two years ago, Governor McAuliffe provided pardons to a, a kind of a class of people, and this was challenged, and the Supreme Court of Virginia said, no, you can't do it that way. Governor McAuliffe then went back to the drawing board and made it more particularized. So certainly, there's at least in principle, there is room for a court to examine exactly how the president uses the pardon power, I think. Do you think there have been instances in history where a president has abused the pardon power, Bob? No, I, not not that I'm open, you know, not that uh, certainly not that it's been adjudicated. But for example, uh, in the last, I think the last couple of weeks of his presidency, President Clinton pardoned Mark Rich, uh, who was a fugitive from justice living in I think Zug, Switzerland, and um, Mrs. Rich had made substantial campaign contributions to Mr. Clinton. And he pardoned Rich. And there was an outcry. Uh, I mean, I don't think anybody said that he didn't have the power to do it, uh, although I may be wrong about that part. But, yeah, there was a political outcry and said this is an abuse. But, you know, nothing happened. So, Brian, do you agree with that premise, that there could be instances in which a court would step in and say the president has gone too far with this exercise? Again, accepting the question of, of pardoning him or herself, but could this go too far? Well, I, I think that the federal pardon power is pretty difficult for a court to second guess in that way. Uh, there aren't any procedural requirements. I think in the Virginia case, there were some procedural niceties that needed to be followed. And there's the political question doctrine, where courts are reluctant to second guess the exercise of a power like this that is given by the Constitution pretty much exclusively to the president, just like they won't second guess an impeachment, it's up to Congress to figure out what's impeachable and what's worth convicting, and you can't appeal that through the court system. I think similarly, the courts look at the pardon power as sort of a, a check on the judicial system. 
and um, would be reluctant to adjudicate other than in a case where the president purported to be using his pardon power but was doing something that wasn't actually a pardon. So they would they would police the boundaries of the pardon power, but within the power itself, I, I think it's very unlikely that they would overturn it. If a pardon got into court, it would be something like a version of the Mark Rich case where there was some evidence of a quid pro quo. In fact, um, the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York investigated President Clinton's pardon, and uh, the U.S. Attorney, fellow by the name of James Comey, eventually cleared Clinton of any wrongdoing there. But if there had been bribery, if they had said this pardon was given in exchange for a bribe, my position is the pardon itself would still be valid, but the bribe, the crime underlying it, could be prosecuted. So just because the president has the power to pardon doesn't mean that he's immune from any sort of consequences if he uses that power corruptly. Yeah, I don't disagree. But I just interject, you know, lawyers love uh, hypotheticals. And let me give you a hypothetical to try to make my point. Let's say a president, when he comes into office, says, I hereby pardon all federal prisoners. Uh, Empty out all the federal prisons tomorrow. I'm pardoning everybody. I believe a court would look at that. Um, Well, that certainly is extreme cases uh, one could imagine. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Lawyers I, I love think, extreme examples, right? Yeah, I, but I... Yeah, I, I mean, there is there is precedent for the president pardoning a class of people, right? I mean, Jimmy Carter yes. pardoned all the draft dodgers. Yes. And President Andrew Johnson was very uh, generous with his pardon power uh, as regarded the South after the Civil War. And yes. there was some litigation around some of those pardons, but... I think the case law that emerged from that was, again, very skeptical of any intrusion on the president's power and that the check on the president's abusing the pardon power was through the impeachment process. So I think you're right. A court would certainly, if they were going to look at anything, it would be an extreme case like that. But I I, I think at the end of the day, they would have to leave it to Congress. And what is the, where does the pardon power Begin. I mean, must there have been a charge or a conviction to be pardoned? Must there have been a crime committed for there to be a pardon? Well, Nixon disproves that proposition, does it not? He was certainly not convicted. It, In what way? And he hadn't been charged or convicted, and uh, right. Mark Rich hadn't been convicted, and the Carter pardon of the Vietnam era draft evaders, most of them hadn't been charged or convicted either. Um, right. The, the, so they can be preemptive, but they have to relate back to acts already committed. Whether they've been the basis of a charge or conviction or not is irrelevant, but you can't pardon something that hasn't been done yet. But as as long as the subject of the pardon is something that's already been done, it doesn't have to have been something that the person was charged with, let alone convicted of. Agreed. Yeah. So it can be... Preemptive, but not prospective. Yeah, you can't say, I pardon Joe Schmo for anything he's done in the past and anything he does in the future. And I think that's an example of where a court would intervene, um, because yeah. they would say, you know, so someone might say, well, it doesn't say in the Constitution that it has to be retrospective. And what the court would do is would, uh, they would say, if it's not retrospective, then it's not a pardon. It's a right. uh, suspension of the law. And so anything that's a pardon, we'll give that deference. We might not even take the case. But if if he says it's a pardon and it's not actually a pardon, that we will get involved in and, and say, you can't do that. Right, right. I agree with that, yeah. Do, does a pardon constitute or amount to an acknowledgement of guilt? Does there need to be an acknowledgement of guilt? Well, to me, that was the most interesting aspect of this whole inquiry of by President Trump and his lawyers, is that, you know, I always assumed that Mr. Trump was concerned uh, with respect to Russia about things that fell more into the peccadillos category, uh, you know, perhaps some personal conduct when he was in Russia, or perhaps some aspects of business dealings that might be a little uh, iffy. 
by looking at, at the pardon power, that's by hypothesis, is a crime, which means that he and his lawyers must actually be concerned that there is criminal conduct lurking there. And I found that really, really surprising. My take on this is a little different, and I had a piece about this in the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, a couple of weeks ago, because it is true that in almost every case, a pardon is based on guilt. In fact, if someone is applying through the usual process where the Department of Justice vets pardons and uh, applications and makes recommendations to the president, you're not allowed to even apply for one until you've been convicted, served your sentence, and some time has passed after that. But even though almost every pardon is based on someone who is guilty being forgiven, and even though there is language, uh, there's dicta, uh, sort of an an aside in a, a case called Burdick versus the United States from 1915, where taken out of context, they say a pardon is based on guilt. Accepting the pardon is an admission of guilt. The pardon power does encompass the ability to exonerate people. It's almost never used that way, but there would be nothing stopping the president from saying something to the effect that uh, there's a criminal investigation, but it's unfair, it's inappropriate, it's a runaway prosecutor. Uh, The president could say, all of these things that they're investigating these people for are illegitimate charges. No one did anything wrong. I have the power to stop that with my pardon power, and I'm going to use that power. Now, whether the public viewed the pardon that way, whether they said, he's right, these people are innocent, or whether they said, oh, well, if they weren't guilty, they wouldn't need a pardon, that's a political question. But as a legal matter, I don't think that there's any sort of automatic uh, imputation of guilt based on a pardon being issued or or the pardon being accepted if the president phrases it as an exoneration. Uh, and, And occasionally presidents and governors do use it to exonerate people who don't have any way of getting that exoneration in court. So uh, that I, I agree with what you say from a legal standpoint, from a political standpoint, nobody's going to would take that seriously in, in the case we're talking about the Trump matter. Well, I think that uh, he's shown an ability to spin narratives that his his base, uh, rather significant number of people, do accept that if he was calling the investigation into question, people would, some people would would go along with that. But ultimately, it would be a political question. It would come down to what people, and particularly people in Congress uh, who have the power to impeach, thought about it. Yes. Well, I want to pick that up in just a moment, but I have to take a short break here. We're going to continue our discussion of the presidential pardon power in just a moment. Please stay with us. Documents are the currency of business. They represent you in every business interaction. Executives need to know what changes have occurred in documents, what metadata risks exist, and how to encrypt, share, and collaborate securely. The Terra simplifies the document creation and collaboration process to protect you from risk and loss of reputation. The Terra offers better solutions for document lifecycle management so you can focus on doing what really matters www.latera.com. Imagine what you could do with an extra eight hours per week. That's how much time legal professionals save with Clio, the world's leading practice management software. With intuitive time tracking, billing, and matter management, Clio streamlines everything you do to run your practice from intake to invoice. Try Clio for free and get a 10% discount for your first six months when you sign up at their website, clio.com, that's C-L-I-O.com, with the code L2L10, that's L2L, the number 10. Welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. This is Bob Ambrogi, and joining us today are Brian Kalt, professor of law at Michigan State University College of Law, and Bob Dietz, professor of public policy at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. We're talking about presidential pardon power. And uh, I do, I want to get to the big question here uh, that's been bandied about quite a bit, which is whether the president 
does have the power to pardon himself should the situation arise. And I want to ask both of you about that. But Brian, let me start with you. Well, um, I've argued that the president does not have that power, but I think we have to start from the idea that there really is no way of predicting what a court would do. There are arguments on both sides. And I could see there being votes, maybe enough votes, for saying that he can. I, If I were a judge, would not vote that way. But I, I don't want to say that this is settled and that he can't do it, because really we don't know. The arguments are a lot simpler on the side to say that he can do it, which is, you look at the Constitution, it doesn't say he can't. It says he has the power to pardon. It doesn't say anything about an exception for self-pardons. Uh, the argument on the other side, there's a historical part of it, which sort of too much to get into here, but there are two main parts. One is just the general notion, like uh, Bob had referred to before, that we read common law notions into the Constitution sometimes, the general notion that you can't be the judge in your own case. And if you want a pardon, you have to get it from someone else. Uh, just like if you're on trial and you're a judge, uh, someone else is going to preside over that trial, not you. And there's there's counter arguments to that, but I think that's a powerful uh, a powerful argument. And then the other one is just that a pardon, just by its definition, is inherently bilateral. It's something you can only give to someone else. And again, that's not in the expressed in the text. But as we said before, the the idea that you can only pardon retrospectively isn't written in there either. It's just inherent in the notion of what a pardon is. And so I would argue, you know, you look at the the Latin root of the verb to pardon, some other words from the same root are donate or condone. It wouldn't make sense to say that you made a donation to yourself or that you (laughs) condoned your own actions. By the same token, saying that you pardoned yourself, that's not a pardon. Uh, It's inherently it just doesn't make sense. And so it's just inherently outside the definition of the pardon. That's If I were a judge, that's how I would base my ruling that the president cannot. But we don't know. And Bob, what's your opinion on this? Can the president pardon himself? Yeah, I agree with everything that um, Brian has just said. I think that, I guess my sense is that these constitutional questions, again, because of our kind of common law tradition, are so factually driven And I think it might well depend, certainly at the trial court level, on the facts that were adduced to uh, in the case. Uh, I could imagine, I think I could create some hypotheticals in which uh, judges would feel almost compelled to say, no, you can't do that. Uh, And another, I think I could create another set of, of facts where a judge might well say, yeah, that's okay. But it is, you know, this <laughs> this is like, uh, you know, the guarantee for Republican government for the states. It's just unadjudicated, and uh, and you know, who the hell knows? Yeah, I did. I know. I read that there was a Justice Department opinion to that same effect during the Nixon administration, concluding that the president could not pardon himself. Is that right? Did I have that right? Yeah, N- Nixon, when he was at the end of his uh, rope, there uh, asked his own team. Uh, what his options were, and one of the options, his his personal lawyer said, you could pardon yourself. That is possible. The Department of Justice at the same time analyzed it, wrote a memo relying mainly on the can't be a judge in your own case idea, said that the president could not pardon himself. And of course, they would be the ones prosecuting. And so it's no surprise that the lawyers on either side came to different conclusions there. But Presumably, if the president did try to pardon himself and if the prosecutor wanted to pursue him anyway, then and only then would a court have to decide. But those are some pretty big ifs. But yeah, if I could just add something to that. In order to challenge a pardon, there has to be a case or controversy. And I could well see somebody like uh, Mr. Mueller, if he has what he believes is a strong case, in order to create a case or controversy, would have to indict. And an indictment would lay out all the stuff that President Trump doesn't want laid out. And I can imagine a, an indictment with enormous detail, which, you know, it could well render the whole can I pardon myself question moot because of the possibility of impeachment. Can a president be prosecuted while in office? <laughs> That's uh, so. My 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 book, Constitutional Cliffhangers, 
has uh, six chapters, six different questions. Chapter two is, can the president pardon himself? Chapter one is, can you prosecute a sitting president? The prosecution of a sitting president is, is an open one as well. And certainly prosecutors in the past have been reluctant to pursue a sitting president. Nixon was named an unindicted co-conspirator. But if that weren't the case, right, if you, if you could prosecute a president while he was in office, then the self-pardon would sort of render that moot. If self-pardons were possible, then uh, presumably any president who didn't consent to be prosecuted would be very tempted to use it. But, but that's an open question, too. Uh, president Clinton also uh, was facing some criminal charges. He uh, negotiated the day before he left office with Special Prosecutor Robert Ray, settling all of that. But presumably, Ray had something that he was waiting until Clinton left office to pursue. Bob, do you have anything to add to it? Yeah, yeah I think um, I don't see anything preventing a prosecution of a president, and it's, it, any more than uh, prosecuting a, a member of the judiciary or the senator or house. It sure as hell be awkward, but the Constitution could live with that. Meaning, we, you know, we've we've got a uh, a vice president. There's a you know a constitutional amendment that addresses what what do you do if the president, in some sense, is incapacitated. So I I find that actually uh, you know marginally easier open question than the can you pardon yourself question. Well, I would just I would distinguish prosecuting a judge or a member of Congress, uh, and, and I agree there are good arguments on both sides, and it could go either way. But uh, the president, under the unitary executive theory, the, the, you look at the first clause of each article of the Constitution. Congress has hundreds of members in it, and if one of them is away being prosecuted, they can still function. Uh, The judiciary has hundreds of judges in it, but the president himself uh, is the repository of all of the executive power of of the country. So for the executive branch of the federal government to be prosecuting its own head is a little strange. (laughs) There's some uh, issues with a state purporting to do that as well. And then if, um, if, president is being prosecuted, and you you mentioned that the the vice president is there as his understudy, but if the president doesn't want to hand power over, it's actually pretty difficult to force him to. And I think the question is, you look at the Constitution and you say, who's who's in a position to force the president to give up power before his term is over? And I think impeachment sort of shines... Uh, in the Constitution as the mechanism that we're supposed to use in those situations. And I think that's why prosecutors have been reluctant to get out in front of Congress. That's why Ken Starr sent his report to the House rather than trying to indict Clinton himself. With regard to the ongoing uh, Russia investigation, were the president to, say, pardon somebody uh, in his inner circle, how would that affect the special counsel investigation, and what impact would it have on any congressional investigation separate from the special counsel's investigation? Well, the kind of odd thing about President Trump pardoning, say, you know, Junior and Eric and um, and his son-in-law is that at that point they're out of legal jeopardy, which means they no longer have a Fifth Amendment right, uh, which means that, that then Mr. Mueller can get everything. And in some ways, if I were President Trump's lawyer, I would weigh that very carefully. In some respects, I think President Trump would just as soon all these people um, uh, claim Fifth Amendment privilege. And I guess the same would go for any congressional investigation as well. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I assume, and I don't know this, but I assume that the congressional investigation is coordinating at some level with the Mueller investigation. Remember what happened with, um, with Ali North. Uh, and I don't think they want a repeat of that. Yeah, I, I agree that the pardon would make it harder to convict the people being pardoned, but it would make it easier to investigate, and Congress would not have to worry as much about them pleading the Fifth, although they might still be able to plead the Fifth in light of the fact that the pardon could only touch federal criminal charges. So if they had a plausible argument that there were potential state criminal charges, they might still be able to 
plead the fifth. But there's no way that the pardon power would derail the investigation itself. And if, um, well, I think the analogy is to Iran-Contra. You mentioned Ali North. When President Bush 41 had already lost uh, his reelection bid, but was still in office. Sorry, we got a fire truck going by here. Um, he was still in office. It was just before Christmas, 1992. And he pardoned everyone facing charges in Iran-Contra, including Casper Weinberger, whose trial was supposed to start a week and a half from then. And that shut down the investigation. It didn't shut it down because there was nothing left to investigate because Bush himself was under investigation. But the prosecutor said, there's no one left to prosecute except Bush, and I'm not going to prosecute him, so I guess I just have to go home now. And and that's what happened. So as a practical matter, it might take all the air out of the investigation. If there's no one left to prosecute but the president, it might have that effect. On the other hand, if the prosecutor really does want to pursue the president, as Bob mentioned, it would make it easier to get testimony against them, assuming that people could be forced to testify. They, they might just say, well, I can't plead the fifth, but I don't remember anything. So there's not much you can do about that. Um, you know, bear in mind, though, that, that given our, our president's pension for identifying fake news and, and, you know, there's nothing to this, et cetera, et cetera, I would think that human nature on the part of a prosecutor might make him reluctant just to sort of fold his tent as though, yeah, I guess he was right. There was nothing here. Uh, and that's why I lean more toward a prosecutor forcing the issue by bringing a case or controversy, by bringing some sort of an indictment, or at least a very full report to the American people explaining, to the best of his understanding, what actually happened. Well, we are just about at the end of the time for this show. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to give us your final thoughts on this topic. And if you uh, care to let our listeners know how they can uh, follow up with you or, or find out more about your work, uh, welcome you to do that as well. So, Bob Dietz, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. I, I find this, you know, I've been in Washington my whole career, and I often feel that I've kind of seen everything. And then, uh, and then something like this arises, uh, in which it's forcing everybody, not just lawyers, but, you know, citizens, to think about their country, their constitution, what it all means, and so forth. And, you know, in many ways, I think that's, that's healthy. It, it's clear that our institutions, and to my mind at least, it's clear that our institutions are holding, and I find that positive. To me, what matters most about what's going to come out in the next uh, number of months in this investigation is what facts are going to come forward. And I think everything that follows from that, whether it's prosecutions, pardons, or impeachment, will depend upon the power of those facts. Um, I'm at George Mason University. Uh, they've got a website. I'm reachable. My email's there. I'm reachable. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. And uh, Brian Colt, your final thoughts. Well, I like to pick up where Bob left off and agree that the facts are important. And in a sense, this is a very premature discussion because we don't, we don't know what uh, the investigation is going to come up with. We don't know how the president's going to react. We don't know how Congress will react to that. But I do think that it's an important reminder of the original constitutional design here. When the framers at the Constitutional Convention were discussing the pardon power, they were very concerned that presidents would abuse the pardon power. They discussed the prospect of a, a bunch of co-conspirators led by the president committing treason and thought maybe they should limit the pardon power to prevent the president from pardoning people in that situation. And faced with that uh, extreme hypothetical, they decided that it was inappropriate to limit the pardon power, that they needed to give a broad, unrestricted power to the president, and that if he did abuse it in that way, that the remedy was impeachment. So when people talk about the Constitution as sort of guaranteeing some good result, oh, we, we couldn't do that because that would be terrible. The Constitution can't allow that because it would be, uh, it would put people above the law. The constitutional design is to remedy that with impeachment, to give the president the power and give Congress the power to punish that. I would direct people who want to get in more into the details to check out Chapter 2 of my book, Constitutional Cliffhangers, A Legal Guide for Presidents and Their Enemies. It's available on Amazon. I think they have a few 
copies left, and there's the Kindle version. And I'm always happy to reply to emails. And I'm at Michigan State University, and they have a website. You can get all my contact information there. Well, as of earlier this afternoon, they still had a few copies left because I checked that out myself. So thanks a lot to uh, both of you. Uh, We've been talking to Brian Call, Professor of Law at Michigan State University College of Law, and Bob Dietz, Professor of Public Policy at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Uh, Really appreciate your uh, thoughts and insights on this topic. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. You're very welcome. My pleasure. And that uh, brings us to the end of another show. Uh, Thanks uh, to uh, our producer, Kate Nutting, our audio engineer, Adam Lockwood, our executive producer, Lawrence Coletti, and all the good folks at the Legal Talk Network. And thanks to you for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrogi for their next podcast covering the latest legal topic. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.